Good afternoon, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Ranking the Albums. Today, we're going to look at the short but really, really great discography of a very cool band. And I brought the right guy to talk about this band here. We've got returning to the show after about a month. We've got Brian Slagle, the founder of Metal Blade Records. What's going on, my friend? How are you? You know, hanging in there. Crazy times, but, uh, you know, hockey's back on Tuesday, so I'm getting very excited about that. Something to look forward to. I, I watched the Mets yesterday for the first time I, in, seems like, ages. I was loving every second of it, and uh, yeah. no matter how weird it was to see, like, cut out people in the stands and piped-in crowd noises, the game was great, and I, I didn't care. Yeah, I watched the Dodger game, and the cutouts are a little creepy for me. <laughs> I mean, it is, but, I, I mean... How, how often do you really like pay attention to what's going on in the stands, I guess, right? I don't know. It's true. This yeah. is true. But I just, I thought it was great to be watching sports of any nature because uh, it's, it's been way too long. Agree a thousand percent. Yeah. So, so Brian, uh, like I said, is the perfect guy to talk to about Sirith Ungol because of the big history, long history on Metal Blade Records. And uh, I think before we kind of get started with our ranking of these, uh, you know, five albums, not a big catalog, could you talk maybe a little bit about kind of like how you guys came about discovering these guys and like had a little bit of history there. Well, this is like one of the most amazing stories ever really because so Siri Dungle really predated the whole LA metal scene. Yeah. They started they were, they were from Ventura, California, which is about 45 minutes north of, of, of LA. So they weren't really part of the scene as lazy little beach town up, uh, up in the northern part of, of uh, Southern California. And uh, so they started in like 1977, I think. Uh, kind of just as a, you know, obviously based on a lot of the music that was happening in the 70s. And they somehow were able to self-finance and put out a record, which was the, the first record, Frost and Fire. And, you know, I was working at the record store at that point and, and, and somehow found the record. I was like, what is this? First of all, cover was amazing. And then, you know, listen to it, I this is really cool. And then got in touch with them and, and became friends with them. And they started, we started getting them to play shows in LA. And, you know, obviously they put out a second record and then we, you know, we started getting more involved with them. But the weirdest, so this is how, where the story goes off, off the rails. So, you know, in LA in the early eighties, you have the two scenes, you had the, the glam scene, the Molly Crew Rat, et cetera scene. And then you had the, the metal scene, which was Slayer, Metallica, Armored Saint bitch on and on. And Serial will never really fit in with either of those two scenes. I mean, they, they were probably more akin to the heavier scene. And, you know, they would play, because I, I love them, I would put them on, you know, a bunch of shows uh, that, that we were doing in LA with, you know, the, the usual bitch, layer armor saying all that sort of stuff. Um, but they never really connected with the crowd, particularly because they were doing something so different. Like there, it was, 70s prog metal whatever and they never connected with anybody the records didn't really connect with the metal community at that time either and you know i i, I thought they were amazing and they they would also have um, so their guitar player who sadly passed away who was on the original records jerry um was i think in the i don't know how many years i knew though and maybe he said five words to me or to anyone <laughs> he was one of those super quiet shy guys and and he would constantly have issues performing, like there'd be equipment problems. So that they'd, they'd be performing and there'd be like three songs without a guitar. <laughs> so that didn't help. So at some of the bigger shows that would happen. But I always thought they were really amazing. I love those records. And then just over time, they've, they've become this massive cult band, which is, yeah. I've never seen a story in the you know, 38 years I've been doing this, where you know this little tiny band that came from kind of nowhere, that put out a few cult records, all of a sudden over, and never connected in the beginning, all of a sudden over all these years now have this huge connection. I think my favorite story was, was Monty Connor, the famous you know, Roadrunner A&R guy. He's a good friend of mine who hated them. In the beginning, just under a joke, which a lot of people did because it was so weird. Then he, like many people, well, I don't know how many years ago it was, like five, six, seven years ago, just out of the blue sent me an email like, dude, I'm, all I've been doing is listening to old Sir Thongle. This band is amazing. How did I miss this? How, and that's kind of what happened. And the Europeans really they were the ones that, that started a lot of that. And so here we are all these years later where now they put out a new record and they're touring and it's just, it's crazy. It's, I would never... It, it's hard to predict anything like we never would have predicted that, you know, Metallica or Slayer would be this big, but I also would never predict that Sir Dungle would all of a sudden come back and have this incredible career at the, at, after so many years. 
And, you know, they're still one of those bands that like, you listen to their music. It's, it's no different than it was, you know, 35 years ago. It's like, yeah, so it's like if you're talking to someone who's never heard this band before and you're trying to explain them, you really can't. It's like they're kind of traditional metal. They're kind of proggy. They're kind of, some people call them like one of the first power metal bands. Some people call them doom. I, you yeah. know, it's like they it's don't really lot. fit. There's no box there. Out. Yeah, it's a lot of elements. And I think one thing that, you know, that I, I always think that the reason why bands get successful is because they're doing something different and original. And clearly you can't, you know, when you hear this band, they, they sound different from everybody else, which in the beginning kind of hurt them. Yeah. Uh, but now over all these years, they've, they've found an audience and it's been, it's great because they're such great guys. And just to see this kind of renaissance happen to them after all these years. I mean, I was begging them, I mean, probably eight or nine years ago when this first kind of started happening, you guys should do something else. You guys should play some shows like Tim Baker, the singer uh, from the band, uh, his son was a huge fan of Killswitch Engage. So I got him into the, they played a big show at the Palladium. This has got to be seven, I don't know, seven years ago, or whatever long ago it was. So he was there. I hadn't really seen him for a while. I was talking to him. I go, why don't you, you know, why don't you get the band back together? You guys, all this stuff has happened. Like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I, you know, blah, this is the whole thing. And I think they finally started seeing the response from Europe and, and they, you know, got a pretty big offer to play one of the festivals over there. And then when they went over and did it, they saw, I mean, the biggest reaction they ever got in their entire career. I'm like, oh, wow, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we should do some more stuff. It, it's a great success story when you think about it. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Tim and pro probably I think back in the day, one of the reasons why people might've been on the fence about the band's music is, I mean, his vocals are, there's nothing like him. Nobody sounds like him. And it's, he, I think back in, you know, the early mid eighties, it was either you love him or you don't. Right. Cause uh, he kind of had that voice. And what's amazing now you listen to him today. He doesn't sound any different. I know he, he blames himself for, he's like, ah, people couldn't, couldn't take my vocals. But I mean, look, King Diamond's vocals are extreme. You know, a lot of bands vocals are extreme. You can even say, you know, Axl Rose is extreme and you know, all that sort of stuff. So I didn't think he was that different from, from everything else but but you know all those sort of things you know you, you have to have a particular taste for it and, and yeah I was really surprised two vocalists that really blow me away at, at how they had a long time where they didn't do it it was John Arch who you know came back with the Arch Matheo stuff and now Tim who you know didn't sing for, for how 20 years or something they yeah. come back and all of a sudden they sound exactly like they used to that's which as we've seen with a lot of aging singers that doesn't always happen. That voice goes, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe not using it for a while. I, who knows? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what the trick is. I don't know. But I still remember going to a record store back in whatever what year was that? Uh, 1984 and seeing King of the Dead in the racks and thinking, I've never heard of this band before. Man, do I love, because I was a big Tolkien fan and I love all that kind of stuff. And I was like, I don't know who drew that cover. It looks like Frazetta because, you know, you had the Molly Hatchet covers. Yep. Like, but that is amazing. And I'm buying it. And then bringing it home and thinking, this is really different, but I like it. Right. And it, there was no other band like it. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's a like great said, story. I, I've always loved them and, and been a huge fan from, from day one. And, you know, I did everything I could in, in the early days to get them to, you know, something to happen for them. But it just, like I said, they're just so different and unique. That's why I love what's happening now is that over all these years, they've, they've got this huge cult following now. And, you know, we put out the new record. It did really, really well. Unfortunately, you know, they're going to do a bunch of festivals over the summer, which didn't have, they have their own festival now too, which is crazy. But, uh, next year, I guess. Next year, that's all. So now that you got a little bit of history uh, from the man himself, so let's rank the albums. So we got five of them. We're going to start with our number five, go to number one. Uh, Brian, I don't know about you, but not a weak album in this in this discography at all. Obviously, a couple are a little better than the others, I think. But uh, yeah, be interesting to see how we rank them and if uh, we're similar or not. So I'm going to let you go with your number so five. Just to clarify, obviously, the live album's out. So right. which of the two, is it Service of Chaos or Paradise Lost that we're not including uh i've included paradise lost in mine okay cool well then that's where i start at number five with paradise lost yep yep that's me too yep. and again a good record considering this was their first one in what about five years i think yeah and they were you know it was one of those things where they were kind of coming back and i think you notice in the record this, there's a lot of different styles happening there is yeah they're kind of again trying to figure out what do we do how do we do something and you know it's a good record but 
it wasn't for me there parts of it are great but there's a lot of it that's not really true Sir you know, I yeah i mean there's a little um and you know obviously jerry and flint were no longer in the band at the time you still had uh tim and robert who have been kind of spearheading the band you know, yep. from the year going forward uh, I think half the album is classic Sir Thungle, and the other half is kind of like this weird, like 80s, almost kind of like hair metally thing. I hate to say that, but there's kind of like this very commercial aspect to it. Um, but I got to tell you, and I almost, I was re listening to this this morning and I almost forgot. They do one of the best like covers ever on this album. They do Fire by Crazy World of Arthur Brown, which is absolutely terrific. And I don't want to say it's the best song on the album, but it's it's damn good. Uh, the Troll is really good. Paradise Lost, the title track is good. Uh, Chaos Rising is a good track, but it's a solid album. Uh, not quite as up to par with the rest of them, I think. So, yeah, so I'm gonna agree Tim, Tim singing Fire is amazing. It's great. It's, it's so good. So great. <laughs> it's so good. I was like, I, I, I literally listened to it like twice this morning. I'm like, oh, damn, I forgot how good this cover is. It's, uh, it's a great song anyway, but uh, they totally make it their own. So uh, there you go. Okay. All right. Number four, what do you got? Uh, number four, I've got the latest album, which I truly love and, and very happy that, that they were able to do it. Forever Black. Really good. And, and so, the amazing thing too is that they've, still over all these years have still have the relationship with Michael Whelan, who of course did all the covers and still kind of blows my mind that, uh, you know, a band from nowhere that had nothing going on back even before I knew them was able to get this, you know, pretty famous guy <laughs> to allow them to do album covers because it's not that easy. We, we've tried a lot of that over the years. It's a little more difficult than you think. So the fact that, that he allowed them to do that and they've basically had this relationship the whole time. All well, this time, yeah, exactly. All right, so you and I are going to differ a bit on this one, but uh, I'm going to go, now my number four was the debut from 1981, which I like a lot. Uh, doesn't quite sound like they've really found their footing yet here. Uh, I think the songs are good. The lyrics are obviously very cool. I mean, their lyrics are, are awesome, and I'm not much of a lyric guy, but again, it's all that kind of like sword and sorcery and fantasy stuff, which is very cool. Uh, the album cover is amazing i mean again you touched on it earlier to be a, an unknown band getting this for your album cover that doesn't happen too often right and that, um, that helped them tremendously too oh, i think big if they time, didn't yeah. have that it would have been even tougher yeah big time but some good songs on here you know better off dead is, is really good edge of a knife is great the title track is great uh i'm missing like a little bit of the kind of heft of, and the guitars that i think would come on the next two albums but i think you kind of hear some of their like early kind of prog leanings on this album and it's, it's amazing, too, when you listen to the first couple albums, how really great of a bass player Flint was. And, and Jerry, too, a guitar player. Really, really good players, those guys. Yeah, that's the thing is they were, I thought they were incredible musicians. And, and the stuff they were doing in the studio, like, I think part of the problem is they couldn't really, especially Jerry, was, it was difficult for him to transition all that live. But yeah, as musicians, especially in the studio, I mean, they're, they, were doing, I mean, they were doing stuff back then that, Again, that's the testament to why it's still popular today. Is you know you listen to that stuff and it's like, wow, this is really pretty spectacular. Yep, exactly. I totally agree. And then uh, to segue, my number three is is Frost and Fire. I went back and forth between the, the two the two records because obviously I love the new record and it, it, I think it came out really great. I'm super happy with it. But I, I put Frost and Fire just a little tiny bit ahead of it. All probably more of a of a just because that was a special place for me because that was the first thing I heard from them. And, yeah. you know, literally back in those days, in the early 80s, you know, I was all about the New Wave of Heavy Metal and all this sort of stuff. And there's no band. And at that point, there were really no bands in, in, in the U.S. that were doing anything. And to find this little random band from nowhere that had put this album out, it was like, well, this is kind of, this is pretty cool. And they're doing something that's both modern, but also has a, a real 70s rock tinge to it, which, of course, is... Well, I grew up in the 70s and I like that sort of stuff. So I put Frost and Fire at number three just a little bit. It's a little tight, like neck and neck with them. So I had a really hard time with my number two and three. Um, one of them, obviously, I have a lot of history with. The other one is brand new and I've been listening to for months and really loving it. So, you know, if you ask me this again in six months, I might flip flop these around a little bit. But... I'm going to go with what my gut is telling me today because I'm so into the new one. Uh, I'm going to put it number three, one foot in hell, but this is damn good. I mean, I, I could see anybody putting this as their favorite because it's, and I remember when this came out, you know, the second album is really heavy 
and then they put this out, it's even heavier and darker. And I think there's just some great, like 100 Miles an Hour is amazing. Doom Planet is so good. Chaos Descends was like one of my favorite songs of the time. I remember when this came out, I was like, ah, oh, this is such, and his vocals are like, like he went and took like a, a glass full of broken glass and just like kind of drank it and was like, here we go, let's go into the studio. And that's what he sounds like. And the riffs are just great. And, uh, and it's got a Brian Slagle production credit on it. That's pretty cool too. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, and that, again, segues perfectly into my number two, which is that record. And I agree with everything you said. I, I think Tim's performance on that record is absolutely spectacular. And he's such a good guy. It was really, you know, uh, I'm not a producer, but I was just in the studio kind of help trying to do what I could do. And uh, working with him was, was so fun. But I'm really, that record's hard for me to listen to because I really don't like the production on it. And it's, obviously partially my fault because I was there but we couldn't the, we couldn't get the drum the drum sound just we couldn't dial it dial it in at all Bill Matoyer you know engineer who engineered you know, all that stuff we we couldn't dial it in um you know and Rob's Rob's an interesting drummer because he he hits very lightly so you know today it's no big deal you just program stuff and it's really easy a lot of drummers hit very lightly today um, but, but he was hitting it very lightly, so it's difficult to dial the drum sound. The drum sound, every time I let that stuff comes up, I listen to it. The drum sound really bothers me. It's like, damn, I wish you go back and fix it. But, but there's, yeah, great tracks on there. I mean, you know, One Foot in Hell, Cast. I mean, and you're right, it's, they were kind of, you know, they were getting into the heavier scene at that point because, you, know, you know, all the bands and talent, and stuff, they had all kind of come out. I think they wanted to try to fit in a little bit more of that scene, so it's a movement of a heavier record. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's my number. So I do I do love I do love the songs. I said the drum the drum sound though is always drives me crazy. It's one of those things. Damn it, I wish it was better. And that, that cover. I mean, hopefully you guys can see that. But I you know back in the day, I remember buying this on LP and just sitting there with that and like some pretty spectacular stuff. So, so what happened to these guys after this album? It's like, all of a sudden they just kind of like disappeared. Is, was there any, like anything that kind of prompted that or? Hi, you know, I think that they, it's, it's, you know, back then it was very difficult to be, to be, I mean, they, they, they never really toured and they never really, really got a foothold in, in anything. And that, you know, that record was kind of the, let's give them a big push. Let's try to make something happen. It was also a weird situation where they were on Enigma prior to this, which was our distributor. And I actually hooked them up with that. And they had a, uh, a difficult relationship with them that didn't help things. So I think they were just, at that point, they had all kind of tried to make, get something to happen. They had some not great relations with, with Enigma. Uh, we tried to help them. And it just, you know, there was just not a lot going on. At, at some point, you know, real life gets in the way where, you know, you've got to, you know, get a job and do all these sort of things. And that's, I think, basically kind of what, what happened. I think they got a, just a little disillusioned by, you know, wanting to be, you know, they wanted to be a, a bigger band. And it just, it just at that point, it just didn't happen. Again, because they were doing something so different and, and unique. And that's, again, why I love the whole story now, because, you know, all these years later, they've, they've come back and they're doing things at a, at a high level again. And the reception is just really great, especially for Rob and Tim who, you know, been doing this for so long and, and felt, uh, you know, they'd done some great art. They just felt like they didn't get any recognition. And finally to go, I remember when they went, I wasn't there, unfortunately, but they went to the first show they did in, in Europe. I think it was a Kiva Truth Festival. There's like 3,500 kids that are all flipping out. And I, <laughs> another quick story too about them is, so I, I realized, I forget when it was, but it was same thing like seven, eight, nine years ago, I was over in Europe. And all of a sudden, I would go to festivals and I'd start seeing certain humble shirts just randomly pop up. And every time you see a kid, I go, it's a cool shirt. And they're like, oh, yeah, we love them. And so it was, that was when I was like, this is where, well, first of all, where are they getting these shirts from? And <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> second of all, like, wow, that's a really odd band to have a shirt from in, in Europe. From, but uh, yeah, so uh, pretty cool. But yeah, I think after that record, they just, you know, they tried. Uh, you know, they, they waited a few years and tried Paradise Lost, like I said, to try to try to make something happen. And it just, uh, again, the label issues were a little, a little tough. And then, yeah, just, you know, at that point, they just, you know, they'd given it a shot. It just didn't work out. So um, and well, often you hear that similar story, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, sadly, that's the story probably 99% of the time. So. Yeah. But, yeah. And again, not, not to keep belaboring the point, but again, that's why this, their story is so special. Like this, these sort of things just rarely ever happen and, and to really good people too, which is cool. Yeah. 
So that leads up to my number two. I'm going to go to Forever Black. I've been listening to this nonstop since it came out. In fact, I remember, I think, the, the week that it came out, I actually had you on a show. I don't even remember what the show was. And we were just kind of chit-chatting. And we were talking about new releases. And I just kind of pulled it. And I'm like, this is damn good. And, and it's so heavy. And it just sounds great. And Tim sounds great. And it's just, and it's like, it's one of those albums that like, cause I, I've talked about this so much on the show. It's like, you have a lot of bands in the, in the CD era who put out new releases. It's like 13, 14, 15 songs. And it's just like, you know, you get three quarters of the way through and it's kind of like, all right, it's overstated. It's bounds a little bit. It's good, but it's just too much. This is just absolutely perfect. I think, what is it like maybe 38, 40 minutes? It's just, mm -hmm. it's absolutely perfect length. Uh, the songs kick ass. I mean, Legions Arise is one of the best things they've ever done. Uh, Stormbringer kicks ass, Nightmare. I mean, the whole thing is just great and it's so heavy. And for my money, this is like the comeback record of the year. It's yeah, just, and it's fantastic. That, that's always the worry, especially with a band that hasn't been around for a long time. And I, I know it was a, a big worry for them too, where you know you don't want to. You know, they kind of have this this legacy now. You don't want to put something out new that's going to tarnish the legacy. So it was a little worrisome. But once I started hearing demos and what they were doing, I felt they were on the right track, and, and they started to feel more confident because they were happy with the way things were going. And they'd start to play a few shows, and they'd, they'd mix in a couple live songs, and and uh, and the fans would be really into it. So yeah, I, I think they did a great job. It's a great record, and and the reception's been amazing as well. So yeah, it's been cool. Cool. Well, I guess I think we know what both of our number one is going to yeah, be. Yeah, so there's only one left. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, uh, King of the Dead. So not only is King of the Dead my number one favorite Sierra Lungle album, it's definitely somewhere in my top 30 albums of all time. I mean, Finger Scorn, Black Machine. I mean, these, these songs are still, I mean, I still get goosebumps sometimes thinking about stuff like Finger, especially Finger Scorn, that like the, the right. guitar, the acoustic guitar thing. It's just, it's, it's a master, it's master. It's all, 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 the whole record really is a master. Master of the pit. I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, so great. <laughs> Lyrics were great. Just the, and what Jerry was doing guitar wise was heavy, but progressive. And it, and it had a lot of that seventies vibe, but, but it had something new. I mean, it, they're really, it's a, it's a really special album where they made something that you really can't, uh, yeah, you really can't say that it sounds like anything else. It's just... It there. totally doesn't. Yeah, yeah. And, it's... And, and I listen to it a lot, actually. Uh, a lot of it comes out. I have a, an iPod that I have in my car that's got, you know, I don't know, 2,500 of my favorite songs or something on it. And invariably, every couple of weeks, the sort of like, oh, come on. Like, yeah. It still sounds fresh, right? Yeah. It's oh, like... my God, yeah. I, I, so, so good. And uh, like I said, for, you know, my favorite song of this probably Finger Storms because I love big long epic songs. That's a big long epic song with a lot of roller coaster ride stuff. I just I think it's just absolutely fun. Really. Do you think this album here in 2020, or maybe we got to give it more time? Do you think it's going to be looked at as one of the kind of like unsung gems of the 80s? Certainly is so far. I mean, we it's been you know a lot of magazines have done their you know retakes on you know classics you know like underground classic stuff and it's definitely been included in a lot of that and it's just like i said it's amazing because they're getting so much more support and people liking them and especially that album well, whole catalog but that album now than when it first came out so it's one of those who is it like some of the some of the famous painters uh picasso and all these people that weren't you know weren't thought of very well when they were alive after they die everybody loves what they do and Obviously, Sir Thunder isn't dead yet, but it's just, you know, 30 some odd years down the road. It's, it's finally getting the acclaim that it probably should have gotten back in the day. Yeah, I agree. A great catalog. Uh, you know, we're, we're probably going to get kind of in closing here. We're probably going to get uh, a handful of folks who maybe have never listened to this band before. So what would you say in like a sentence or two for someone who's never heard this band before and... How do you explain them? What do you rec how do you recommend them? That that what, what quickly can you say about them uh, for someone who's never heard a lick of their music? Yeah, like I said, it, it's uh, it's it's very progressive. It's got a lot of of influences of seventies progressive stuff. I mean, really, in essence, a lot of what Iron Maiden was influenced by these guys were influenced by. Now, the only thing missing in Sir Longo was probably a little bit of the punk element where. You know, Iron Maiden had a lot of the punk element, and Sirith doesn't really. It's more classic, classic heavy metal, classic prog stuff with a really amazing, shrieking singer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I sometimes, when I listen, especially the early albums, um, 
if you are aware and know and love like caressive steel era rush yep that's kind of what you get a little bit you know maybe with a little doses of sabbath here and there but not quite as doomy uh and some just herculean guitar solos and riffs and things and then that yeah that voice that voice is like nothing you ever heard but uh, i would say give just go listen to this album that's really oh that's yep. that's the place to start and then if you like this i mean the new album uh one foot in hell i mean they're all good so uh and also honorable mention to uh, uh, we did they did a song called Witch's Game, which is kind of the first the first song that they did in 2018 to kind of restart their career. Which uh, you can it's just a single. It's on all the streaming services and whatnot. But it's a big long epic eight and a half minute song. that's pretty cool too. So I want to give an honorable mention to that because I kind of wish they would have put it on the new record. But I get it. It was an older song that they had done, but it's out there. So it's a, if you get into the band, it's another one to check out. Well, maybe you need to convince them to put it on the next album. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> Bands are like, yeah, it's old stuff. We don't. Yeah, want right. It. We've already moved on from there. So yeah, we'll okay. stuff. cool. <laughs> well, thanks again to Brian for uh, joining us on this look at the uh, catalog of Sirithungo. Brian, you want to plug anything before we go? Uh, get the new Sirithungo album or all of their albums if you haven't uh, checked it out. So yeah, just there do that. And Listen to as much music as you can. Buy as much band T-shirts as you can. It's a it's a tough time for all the bands. And honestly, I, I talk to all the bands all the time. And what's really keeping a lot of them alive is is especially the merchandising sales. Like so many fans out there have been awesome. They've like almost all the bands are selling out of all their merch, and that's that's keeping them alive. So continue uh, that support, and uh, also you know buying and listening to music. Absolutely. That's a great, great sentiment there. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody watching, support these bands in any way you can. So very cool. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Thanks again to Brian Slagle. We'll be seeing him in an upcoming episode. So uh, Brian, we'll talk to you soon. Everybody have a good rest of the weekend. We'll see you uh, tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.